All right, well, since we just came from lunch, I'm going to tell you a quick story just to get us uh, kind of back in the mood. Uh, as always, on the second day of conference, you want a story from the night before. So last night, at the end of the speaker dinner, I I'm, uh, I'm wanted to come back. I had like 200 emails to get to. So I call up Uber on my, on my, um, on my smartphone, and uh, it's got surge pricing of 2.7. For those of you that use, use Uber a lot, it means it's expensive tonight for Uber. So I said, OK, I've got to get home anyway. I pushed the button. Four minutes away. And I'm watching it, it goes four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes. And by the time it's getting to 12, my friend Matt here walks up to me and goes, hey, are you heading home? I said, yeah, I'm going to take Uber home. But it's now 12 minutes away. And he goes, that's funny. And he pulls out his device and he clicks away. He goes, well, I got one two minutes away with no surge pricing. He says, what address do you have? And I look it up and I go, 44th Street. He goes, dude, we're not at 44th Street. Where are you? I pinch the map. It's in New York. So I, I ordered an Uber from downtown Manhattan last night, and it was actually driving towards me, getting further away from Manhattan. So I canceled it, and what's funny is that actually it was all to do with my privacy settings, because I denied Uber the ability to track me. And I'd forgotten to undo that before using the app. And so that's a little segue into kind of what we're going to talk about today. And for those of you that have been here for a couple of minutes, you might know who said Tim Berners-Lee is, and if you haven't, you've Googled and found out that that was the inventor of the World Wide Web. And so someone who possibly we all think a little bit of has this a perception that the data that we're creating should be owned by us and not necessarily by the large companies that harvest it or exploit it or make money off of it on our behalf. So I'd like to explore that a bit with you today. Um, there's an environment, there's a uh, convergence point I want to talk to you about. We see um, uh, certainly a big move with uh, governmental policy and regulations, data privacy laws, opt-in legislation. We see a move with huge risk about the cloud. And you just have to ask Ashley Madison or OPM or TalkTalk Talk or anyone about the risk of cloud data. Um, and sanctions, if you get that wrong, there's a huge movement in technological innovation, which is allowing things that haven't been done before. And then there's consumer awareness coming to the surface. And some of you might also know about a guy just about two months ago that shot down a drone with a shotgun in his backyard in California. Why? Because it was above his house. It wasn't his drone. And his daughter was outside suntanning in a swimsuit. So he shot it down. And so who owned rights to that access? Whose data was it? Whose device was it? What control? What privacy? These are great questions. And consumers are becoming very quickly aware of the data they create. So I want to talk you through a few things. The regulatory environment I mentioned, so you know, a lot of opt-in legislation, which says that we now need to actually have choice and choose if we're going to be involved in, uh, in sharing of information. Uh, the GDPR, the General Data Privacy Regulation in Europe, I'm going to talk about at the end of the uh, chat today, but it's extremely important, and it's a tipping point, so you should know about it. And then, um, you know, for those of you in regulated industries, I've been in uh, financial services 20 years, heavily regulated healthcare, regulated insurance, regulated, any of those industries, that you're dealing with customer data, you have to obviously deal with the regulatory side. Um, we talked a little bit about cloud risk. You know, there's uh, Safe Harbor just got uh, smacked down about 10 days ago. Many of you are watching the Microsoft case. If you're not, you should be aware of it, which is the whole ability of the US to basically look into European clouds. Um, this is really important if you're dealing with large sets of data. Um, decentralization has been a big threat. I wrote an article that was published in Forbes about the move towards decentralization. Um, you know, blockchain being a great example, uh, we use block in a fair amount of what we do, and the concept of not having it all centralized is really important. And then the concept of no reliance. Many uh, people are really worried that if they rely on the documentation created or done by someone else, and then that is wrong, you are equally to blame. And in the regulated world, I'll give you one example, HSBC a year ago received a $1.2 billion fine for relying on KYC or Know Your Customer data to open an account for a group that actually was laundering Mexican cartel money, it was drug money, but they relied on another bank. So they had no visibility, but they chose the reliance route. And so now data created by other people can, can cross that kind of that border and start to actually affect you as sanctions as well. And so this whole um, jurisdictional cloud reliance, there's a huge uh, move towards what's called the global identity superset. And I say it's a huge move because I invented the term, so I'll take credit for that one. It's maybe a growing move. But what that means is so many people have said, hey, you know what, my ID is my passport. Other people say, you know what, my ID is some concoction of my Twitter, my LinkedIn, my Facebook, because if there's enough information about me that can be credited, 500 people know me, 
Um, perhaps I, I post this often to Instagram or Pinterest. That can be socialized and run in analytics, and they can say I largely am who I say I am. Google might argue they know who I am because of my location data, because I frequent the same house and business all the time, and so my smartphone knows who I am. Blockchain might say, hey, let's append all these people in the front row, one by one by one, and my doctor knows me, and my dentist knows me, and my banker knows me, and my teacher knows me, and you know me, and you know me, and enough people knowing me says it's me. So blockchain's ID. Governments say, hey, let's stamp a big, super hyper-secure document like a passport or an ID card. The problem with all that is that identification requires two people. It's a counterparty relationship. What that means is one person creates the ID and someone has to accept it. So if you're walking around with a New Zealand real me ID, you might not get very far when you present that in another country or for another purpose. And so what I've argued, and I think what is coming, is the fact that all of those, DNA, fingerprint, are all actually aggregated into what we call one superset. So actually the answer is not which one, the answer is all of it. The actual identifier is you. And so if you can actually aggregate those data sets together, you can now actually create what we call the superset. And then if you can surface the superset into some kind of a market where you can smart match, then anyone looking to identify you in a counterparty relationship can just go, hey, I want these 12 things. And a company like us at Trinomi can smart match that, and then you just surface that, and automatically you can clear on counterparty. In fact, it's kind of cool because we can gamify it and say, hey, would you like 12 things? Give me 12. If you give me 25, we'll give you a better deal. Gold level, platinum level, discount on your mortgage. If you give me 50, I'll give you an even better deal. Reduction in your premium on an insurance policy, maybe. And so the idea of gamification is entering now in terms of the same utility value of your data. But in all of these instances, you're realizing a thread is starting to emerge, and that is the customer is at the root of the use of that data set. Uh, fintech disintermediation, we know about 60% of all financial services, wealth, income, and revenue will likely be lost to fintech in the next decade. That's not 6%, it's 60%. That's incredible. One of the largest, most established industries in history is about to lose the majority of its wealth to the disruption market of fintech. And so if you think about how important that is, then you can look at other markets that have been disintermediated. And I don't have to go far to mention Uber, who we mentioned earlier. They're the largest transportation company in the world, and they own no vehicles. Airbnb is one of the largest housing companies in the world, and they own no real estate. Facebook, one of the largest content companies in the world, they create no content. Are we seeing a thread? The future of disintermediation is the surfacing of your data immediately next to the person that requires it. And that does not occur in so many industries we're looking at, but it's about to change in the financial industry and in the data industry. And it's really important that you're aware of the implications of what that means. And then there's this huge focus on customer experience, which is great, is people want that joyful experience. They want that beautiful, amazing, viral experience they're going to tell their friends about. But everyone's looking not just at today's customers, you in the room, but they're looking at the underbanked. And there have been some slides in other presentations about the four billion people that have yet to really engage in the services that we'd all like to think we can offer them. And then there's the whole idea of they're underbanked because they can't identify themselves. That's part of the reason why. I spent um, uh, three years in Africa working in 21 markets building a pan-African infrastructure, and you found that there are people that have 3G phones all over Kenya and Tanzania and Rwanda, Uganda, Nigeria, but they have no copper cables. They just skipped all that generation. They went straight to the smart device. But many of them are getting paid on their phone. Many of them are using services on their phone. But one of the biggest issues is they can't access because they can't prove who they are. So now surface an ID set. And in real time, you can validate who you are to anyone at any time. And you can then underwrite yourself, removing all that risk. It's a very compelling story. And so if we think about that, it's the rise of the personal data store. It's basically us being able to, over our device, have controlling utility over a data store of our data, and then have digital rights management over it. This is not rocket science. It just took a little bit of invention about two years ago, and while we filed, we filed five patents about what we've done. What's interesting about it is if you think about it, we know the model. It's iTunes. It's Netflix. It's subscribing to some level of data with some level of rights management for some kind of value-added consideration. Sorry, I'm standing in your way. I'll move over. There you go. My bad. I like to walk around. Um, so rights management over personal data can solve a whole bunch of things. But when we say can it, I want to actually suggest that it must, because it does a lot of things. So you people know the saying, content is king. Well, I want you to start thinking consent is king. Okay? 
Consent is the actionable choice of actually being exposed to some informed nature of a choice and then you actually saying, I choose to do X. That's you consenting to the action. Without that, a lot of things go wrong. With it, a lot of things go right. So how does it work in today's world? Right now, we're going 358 degrees around the circle. What that means is we are up there at the top with our smart device and we're creating a whole bunch of data, data points, leaking it through all of our apps and all of our devices and IoT. It's being collected. It's being anonymized because many of the large uh, companies know they don't have the legal rights to your personal data, so they strip all the personal attributes off of it. It's then bought and sold in secondary markets. It's run through analytics and algorithms and AI and machine learning. And it's recompiled and then it's sold into advertising markets. Many of you are probably participate in this kind of whole regime of the utilitarian value of people's data. Understanding the anonymization aspects of it. And more importantly, looking at companies like Google, whose historically 90% of the revenue has come from what? Advertising. So this is big business. But that's a long, takes time, an expensive, painful route all the way around. So I posit, and I would argue that it's kind of logical, why don't you just go the other way? Two degrees. So we call this the two degree solution. One is me outbounding one degrees to someone else, my data, and the other is them one degrees bouncing back to me. Whatever I would like, what, when, how, where, and who, for some value in an immediate goods and services transfer exchange based on my data, my choice, when I want, how I want, who I want, and with whom I want. People kind of get that thread, so we call that two degrees. Much more efficient, disintermediating the entire data industry in a way which will create, and I will mention this, and I'd like to be one of them, but I bet there will probably be 20 of these people. There will be probably 20 unicorns that come out of this space. It's the next trillion dollar market. So it's important you know about it so that you can advise and work with the companies that you consult with or work for the companies you're growing to find out ways to harness the power of what this means. So this is a very busy slide and I'll try and keep it simple. So don't read it unless you really want to, but uh, it'll be av available on SlideShare after. But the use case here is personal data from the Internet of Things devices are being used without consent. That's how it's all working right now. And so at CES Consumer Electronics Show, last year in Vegas, 25% of the entire floor was Internet of Things, one third of which had no privacy policies at all. What does that mean? People are using Kickstarter, they're creating technology at the speed of light, they're chucking it out there and just seeing if it sticks. They have no thoughts about what's happening with that personal data. In fact, most of their business models are predicated on, and forgive me, but some of the people presenting over the last day and a half are saying this on stage, we're just going to collect all this data and sell it. Like, really? Is that your business model? Do you pay attention to what the regulations are saying about the use of personal data? So you need to be extremely careful about what this is. It is social, it is moral, it has legal implications. Fortunately, there's a very, very elegant solution, two degrees. And so we create data, it's being sold back to you in the form of the increased cost of goods and services. Think about that vicious cycle. You create data, they take it from you, they cycle it 358 degrees, they sell it to some company who buys it, who increases the cost of goods and services to sell you something they think you want, and you pay for it. So you're paying for the use of your own data. Okay? And then more often than not, I use this example all the time, as I travel, you know, a fair amount, and I book a hotel room, and I pay for the hotel room, and for two weeks after I've paid for the hotel room, what happens in my social media feeds? Have a guess. I get ads for hotels in that city. Right? You buy a Nikon camera, you get ads for Nikon cameras. Don't they know you've already acquired the asset? Don't they know? I mean, is that the state of today's technology? It actually is. It's because they have no direct channel to you to know what you really want, what you've acquired, and what you're actually looking for at the time in real time. So data scientists unite, we can do something about this in real time. So the solution is really moving towards a personal data store, surfacing rights management in real time, and linking it to vendor networks and real-time payments. So this is why our company has deals with Visa and working with PwC and some of the largest companies in the world because this is where it's going. There's no doubt. And what are the results? Let's just focus on those three. For companies, they cut costs dramatically, 10x improvement in cost cutting, which is a big deal. And they increase loyalty because people now have that digital engagement, that personal engagement they want. End users monetize their own data. I just took the stage three weeks ago at TED talking about the future of data monetization. You will be monetizing your data. Yesterday I tweeted 
that Internet of Things devices will be free in the future. Why? Because of the value of the data you're going to choose to share through that device will actually pay for the utility of the device. And the result is regulatory correct. It's data privacy correct, but I'll take one word there and I'll focus on it. It's morally correct. There's moral high ground in the companies that first choose to act into the space by returning the use of data back to the customers that created by respecting their rights and interest and title to that data, there's moral high ground. And the first people to get the moral high ground in this game will be the people that will always hold that. So every industry has an opportunity, and every one of you has the opportunity with the companies you work for to choose to move in this direction. So there's a tipping point. This is the EU General Data Protection Regulation. It becomes law in either December or January. You have two years to comply. And at the end of 2017, roughly, there will be very significant fines and sanctions. And so three to 5,000 entities in Europe will have to move their entire systems over to some level of informed consent for customer data. So if you're using customer data, identifiable data, if you're monetizing it, sharing it, giving it to third parties, every single one of you will have to adopt under this legislation. And it requires to capture and deliver auditable proof. So one of the things we created is this ability to certify our entire process and deliver what we call true cert, which is an audit level proof of the consent. It requires informed explicit consent, so it has to be identifiable, which means it has to transit the customer, which means all those B2B models will have to find a way to get a C involved in their B2B, because an uninformed customer cannot consent thereby to a B2B delivery. It's going to require a ratio of personal customer data, so you're going to have to have some kind of return feedback loop where you can say, I'd like you to forget me. I'd like you to erase my data. It's going to be guaranteed by law. Without rights management, you ask yourself how you can document that. It's going to require that you're informed of a data breach, immediate, full-time, full-on ability to employ. So an app notification would be a really great way to let people know something's gone wrong. And data portability, access to information, et cetera, et cetera. It's all laid out. We have a white paper on our website. So if you go to trinomi.com, our viewpoints, you can read up about the white paper. So we talk about realizing the potential of customer data through the power of consent. This is what our company does because we've recognized just how critical unlocking the real store of value will be going forwards when you're dealing with identifiable data. Because if you think about it, so much of the data we have has so much value, but unless we can actually connect it to the end user, using their identifiable information, we've only got 90% of the way. So if you want to personalize, if you want to have customer centricity, if you want to be able to find a way that you can actually deliver on what we've kind of been promising for so long, it's that last mile of delivery that is so hard now because of identifying that customer and being able to actually attribute and share and allow them to have that experience. So there's been a lot of chats today about that journey that we're trying to deliver. And so we would argue, and I would certainly argue, that part of that journey is empowering the customer, is giving them the utility of that data set, and then giving them the ability to manage who gets their data, when they get their data, how they get their data, and more importantly, putting it into a format that allows them to monetize it. So Uber did this. Car, excess capacity, Airbnb did it. An even better example, you have a house with an apartment. You have a house with a garage that's not being used. That is your stuff, right? It's your data. It's your property. And you want to make it available to someone. And so you enter Airbnb's site and you make your stuff available on an auction basis. And then they, whoever needs that, would like to bid real time, and you can qualify them. Hey, I like your offer, I don't. I like you, I don't. I agree your price, I agree your terms. And if you choose, you monetize your own stuff. Wouldn't that be cool if we could do it with all our own data? In fact, the regulator is going to require that you do that, so this is why it's such a compelling new business line. And so um, I see I have about a minute or two left. I'll stop there and see if anyone wants to ask any questions.